Let's go! Another Let's go. episode of Blue Gems. We have the pleasure of Ryan. Man, pleasure to have you. Also, oh, bro. we're here in Nashville. We are here in Nashville for the STR, STR Wealth, Wealth Conference. Conference. Let's go. Man. Bro, let's hop in. Tell us a little bit about you. What are you up to? Yeah, let's get in. So, so my name's Ryan. I own a CPA firm that specializes in real estate investors. We do all types of real estate investing. So long-term rentals, short-term rental, commercial buildings, but specific, specifically in the, I would say the last six to six months to a year focused on short-term rental investing because is the tax code blown up for short-term rental investors? Yes, it is. And we'll get into it a little bit further. So my background's in accounting and finance. I was in school for about four years, got my accounting degree, got my finance degree, started learning about real estate a little bit, passed my CPA exam. The reason I fell in love was, with real estate was because I did two tax returns one day when I was in college. I did one tax return for a married couple who made about 250 grand a year. And I did a tax return for a single guy who owned about 18 apartment buildings in Chicago. And the single guy, he was making 400 grand in cash flow from these, from these apartment buildings. He paid less in taxes than the married couple. Wow. He made half is what he did. <laughs> so he's single, so, which means he's in a higher tax bracket than married couple and he made double their money. Damn. And I go to my boss at the time, his name was Jim. And I say, Jim, how is this possible? You know, what, what, what happened here? He goes, it's because he invests in real estate. That's one sentence. And ever since I heard that, my mind spinning, I just need to know exactly how does this guy do this? And I spent the last six, seven years trying to learn exactly that. And here I am today helping other people out. Yeah, wow. amazing. Seven years, so what, what year did you do that tax return? I was 17 or 18. 17, yeah. wow. First year, yeah. And then I was like, oh, I, gotta, I gotta learn all this. I need to know, because there, Robert Kiyosaki, he says that the rich don't work for money. And I don't know how you guys feel about him, but <laughs> he's telling people to buy silver and gold. Like I watch yeah. the TV with my mom. Here he is on this commercial telling you to buy silver. But he's right. If you look at any rich or super wealthy person, they don't have anything coming from box one, W2. They don't have any what's called earned income. All their income is through passive investments, whether it's real estate or investing in businesses and startups. They don't have any money. Uh, they don't work for money, right? The rich don't work for money. And the rich or the rich are taxed way less than middle class or poor people just because of that philosophy of how they earn their money. And Congress, the IRS knows this. You could you could have one guy making five hundred, the other guy making five hundred. But depending on how they make their money, one guy could be paying zero, and the other guy's paying one hundred and fifty, two hundred. So oh, true. I feel that there's a lot of controversy today around, you know, tax the rich and real estate investors, you know, why, why are they not paying taxes? So mm. can you explain why it is that the IRS is incentivizing those people to invest in real estate and not pay taxes? Like, why is it that they're getting those benefits? With real estate, you have to think of everybody that real estate blesses. Okay. You have attorneys are getting paid at closing the title company, the, the agents, contractors, people that are using your property, whether it's long-term or short-term. Everybody gets blessed in real estate and the government understands that. And so that's why they incentivize people to invest in businesses and real estate. Businesses is the same thing. Consumers getting a product, there's employees in that business that are going to take that money and go feed their family or buy more goods and services. But real estate in particular, it blesses everybody. The government realizes that. So they want to give you a tax break. Oh, wow. and then how do you define the difference between passive and active income? Because you mentioned mm -hmm. W-2 earners. So why are W-2 earners taxed more than someone who owns a business or owns real estate, put simply? Yeah, I would say because active or earned income is going to be just that, the W-2 worker or the self-employed person. The primary focus is on what's called FICA tax. So if you look at your W-2 pay stub, there'll be a line for Social Security and there'll be a line for Medicare. I call this the F word, FICA but it's pretty much a working man or woman tax. It's social security. So there's that flat tax for us. It's 7.65%. If you're, if you're an employee, it's 15.3% if you're self-employed over on the, the passive side through real estate, all rental real estate is passive. And so you don't get hit with that 15.3 or that 7.65% tax. So right away, any dollar that you earn in real estate, you save more in taxes than if you were to make it through your day job. But on top of that, when you're a W-2 employee, there's only so many things you can do to offset your tax liability. Realistically, it's contributing to retirement accounts and have more babies. 
That's all you can do if you're a W-2 employee to lower your tax bill. Sure, there's like some odd deductions, but they all require you to come out of pocket for something. Whereas real estate, there's so many expenses that you can take for your, your property tax, insurance, interest. And then we're, we're going to talk about depreciation in a little bit. There's so many expenses that you can do on the real estate side that you just don't get if you're a W-2 employee. And that's why the tax code is blown up for the wealthy, the people who invest in real estate. I say wealthy, but I mean real estate investors of all sizes and scales, right? You could be your first property to your hundredth property. You're going to get some tax benefits. doing that. Yeah. I mean, we've, JB and I have already seen those benefits. And I think one of the, you know, one of the interesting things that I did was I owned a primary residence that I rented out, mm -hmm. you know, a quote unquote house hack. So, so how is that property tax? Like what are the unique rules for someone that might be doing a house hack from a tax perspective? Yeah. So I actually house hack right now. And it's interesting because part of it is your personal residence. Part of it is a rental property or a business. You're not allowed to take expenses attributable to your personal residence, but anything that's attributed to that rental, you can deduct or expense. So for example, I have a property tax bill. I'm able to split that in half. Half of it's my personal use, half of it's for the rental. And I'm able to deduct that portion. And same, same goes with my mortgage interest. Same thing goes with water bill. I pick up the water bill. I get the grass cut every week that I can expense half of that. I just got two big trees cut down in my yard. I can expense half of those. So it's pretty much personal and business use. And you're able to kind of write off some of the costs because otherwise I wouldn't be able to deduct some of those costs because they're all personal use. But because I'm able to say, hey, these are actually business. These are my rental property. I'm able to expense some of those. As my property goes up in value because of the repairs that I do to it, I'm able to capitalize on that from a tax perspective. It's pretty nice. And then one of the things that, you know, if we're, if we're comparing W-2 earners to self-employed or real estate investors, one of the advantages that W-2 earners have is the ability to qualify for loans. So how can a real estate investor compensate for, for the struggles of being able to qualify for a mortgage, a car loan, or whatever the case may be, because they might not be showing any, you know, actual income? That's a great point. I even experienced that myself too, making the transition from a W-2 employee to full-time entrepreneur. And you have to get your financing order to begin with. So I would recommend as many as deals as you can do while you're still W-2, get them because you're going to get better rates, cheaper, you know, better terms. Everything's is going to go smooth because they're going to look at that W-2 or your tax return. And that's, that's all you need. Versus when you become self-employed, they want to see bank statements. They want to see you know, proof of income cash receipts, but there are products out there for people who are self-employed, such as they can go the DSCR route, um, prepayment penalties, higher fees, but there's always an avenue for somebody to get in the game, or they can do a bank statement loan, or they call it like an asset-based lending type where all they care about is, do you have a bank statement that has a down payment and six to nine months of reserves typically? And so there's avenues for people who are even self-employed to get in the real estate game. It's just going to cost a little bit more. And I know there's a lot of, a lot of uh, consideration around depreciation mm -hmm. from the standpoint of being able to qualify for a loan in that in some cases it can be added back. So can you speak to that specifically and where you can add it back and maybe where it would you know, hurt you yeah, from, a, from a lender's perspective? Yeah, so line 18 of your uh, Schedule E where rental activities are reported is depreciation. And depreciation is pretty much a loan that the IRS gives you for the purchase price of your property. So when you buy a property, let's say f it's $500,000 and you know you put your 100 grand down, well, you don't get that 100 grand as an expense because it's equity, but what they do allow you to do is depreciate that 500,000 purchase price. So you're able to recoup that 500,000 over a timeline. If it's long-term rentals, it's 27 and a half years. If it's short-term rentals, it's 39 years actually. And you're able to take what's we call it a phantom expense because you never really come out of pocket for the depreciation every year, but it shows up on your tax return. And I, I call it tax-free cash because we're, we get this expense, but we're not shelling out money for it like every other expense we're going to have. And what happens is you have net operating income or cash flow as we call it, but you have depreciation to go against that. So at the end of the day, you know, let's say I make 20,000 on my property, but I have $10,000 worth of depreciation. Well, now I only, I told the government, hey, I only actually made 10 grand instead of 20. And lenders like Fannie, like Fannie Mae, Freddie, if you look on their guidelines online, 
they're actually required to add back line 18 depreciation because again, you don't come out of pocket for that. Wow. So any lender that says, Hey, we're not able to add it back. It says it in the guidelines on Fannie and Freddie on their website to add back certain expenses. So typically it's depreciation, but then some, some of them will add back interest, insurance, property taxes. So if you go on their website, they'll tell you exactly what they use to qualify you for a loan. And sometimes it gets a little rough with certain lenders uh, especially when you get into accelerating that depreciation, but you're always going to be able to add back the depreciation to qualify for loans. You skipped over accelerating depreciation. <laughs> now I do want to go deeper into that because I know there's some, there's some secrets and there's some tricks to, to get a bonus depreciation on your tax return when investing into a short-term rental. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So typically, you know, let's say I bought a $390,000 building, if it's a short-term rental, I'm depreciating it over 39 years. So just 10, 10 grand a year for 39 years, super slow. Odds are we're not even gonna own that property for 39 years, no way. We're, right. we're gonna own it for maybe four or five years at most or get it, get it rented and flip it for a profit, right? Instead of taking that 10 grand every year, what you're able to do is have a, what's called a cost segregation study performed on the property and break out the components of the building. So what happens if you don't do this is they look at your entire building with all the contents in it and they say 39 years. So that 390 divided by 39. But we know that the build, there's a building structure and then there's everything inside of the building. So the, the cabinets, the millwork, the furniture, the fridge, the stove, all that actually have different depreciable lives than the building. And if you have that engineering firm or some CPA firms do them also, they're able to break out the components of the building and accelerate those uh, depreciate those faster. So most of the stuff that we're around here is all considered five-year life. So anything inside of this building, pretty much, besides you know the studs and the mill and the frame, it can be depreciated right away. And typically, what we'll, we'll, we see is twenty to thirty percent of the purchase price of the property depreciated in the first year. Wow. So go back to that example of hey, I'm getting ten grand a year to offset. You know, let's say I got a three hundred ninety thousand dollar rental. I'm probably making fifty grand on it net. Okay. I get my 10 grand of depreciation. I, I'll tell the IRS, hey, I made 40 grand. Or I can choose to speed up that depreciation. And instead of 10 grand the first year, I might get 70 grand the first year. So then instead of, I have 50 grand of rental income, but I have 70,000 of depreciation. So that's why we call it a phantom expense because, hey, now I don't owe taxes anymore. And actually, I have a loss. I have a tax loss that I'm able to. This is the craziest part about the tax code is, you're able to use losses from one property to offset income from the other. So what we see a lot is people start in the multifamily game or long-term rental game. They got two, three, four going, and then they start buying short-term rentals. Well, by the time they bought that short-term rental, those long-term rentals are cash flowing pretty nice. They're able to do this accelerated depreciation. And you can do this on any property. It doesn't have to be a short-term rental. It's just more lucrative for short-term rentals. They're able to use that loss to offset the income from other properties. So why is it more lucrative for short-term rentals? I, I never, never really yeah. understood that, that point. 39 years versus... So that's one thing, right? So right away, you're already kind of under the gun because instead of depreciating over 27 and a half, it's 39. So that 27 and a half, I'm probably getting 15K a year as opposed to 39, I'm Big getting advantage. 10. Yeah. Right, so there's most, most commercial buildings, there's already that added an incentive to want to speed it up a little bit because it's taking you forever to recoup your cost. The reason why short-term rentals are more favorable from a tax perspective is with long-term rentals or commercial building property, you're not going to be able to use those losses to offset your W-2 or what's called your non-passive income unless you qualify as a real estate professional. So I'm a CPA that works in real estate, but I wouldn't qualify as a real estate professional. You actually have to be in the trenches working. So we have fix and flippers, contractors, wholesalers, agents are going to qualify. But people like us, even though we're in real estate, we're not going to qualify because we actually have to be in the trenches per se. Those people are able to use their long-term rental losses to offset their W-2 income. And we've had some clients do some amazing things. We have you know clients that might be making half a mil, quarter million dollars doing a brokerage buy a few long-term rentals a year and be able to offset their income. That's been around since 1993 or so. But with short-term rentals, because the average guest of the property stays seven days or less, it's not considered the same activity as a long-term rental. And therefore, you're able to use the losses from the short-term rental to offset your W-2 without having to qualify as a real estate professional.
So we have tons of clients who are high earners, doctors, lawyers, nurses that are able to buy short-term rentals. And as long as they meet certain requirements, use those losses to offset their W-2. And the savings are beyond imaginable. If you bought a $500,000 property and you're able to get a $100,000 loss and you're in a $35,000 tax bracket, let's say, that's 35 grand that you just saved that you're able to put down on the next one. And in most cases, the government is essentially funding, I would say 60 to 70% of your purchase price. If you're a high income earner, you're gonna get back that in the form of tax savings. I've seen it. In my, uh, one of my podcasts, I did a breakout of a client who was um, 37% tax bracket, bought 1.5 million worth of short-term rentals using 10% down loans. The savings that he got from the, from the depreciation equaled his total down payment for the 1.2. 1. Wow. Yeah, that's crazy. And, but it goes back to what we were saying before of it's the government's way of kind of incentivizing people to invest in real estate. And it says it in the code that if the, and this is the important part is the average guest has to be stay there seven days or less. So you add up the total amount of days that it's rented divided by the number of stays. And if it's 7.0 or less, it'll qualify. Then there's another piece we'll talk about. You meet those requirements, it's considered transient use property and not like residential long-term rental use. And that's what's going to allow you to do this strategy. We call it the short-term rental loophole. And does that impact where it's reported on the tax return or no? No, not no, actually. So uh, 90% of the time, your short-term rental is going to be reported on Schedule E, just like a long-term rental would. The only time a, uh, a short-term rental goes on Schedule C is if you're performing what are called substantial services. So that's if you say you cook or you're clean while the guest is staying there, or you do bed and breakfast, or maybe you, you hire concierge services. That's going to be substantial services. That's going to go on Schedule C. The rub there is... If it goes on Schedule C, it's subject to self-employment tax, which back to 15 minutes ago, we talked about how that's an additional 15%. So you don't need, it's kind of like a double whammy. You don't even want to provide substantial services because that means you're coming out of pocket to pay somebody to do that for you, or you're doing it yourself. And then you're going to get hit on top of the head with an extra 15% tax. Right. So a lot, of, a lot of short-term rental investors, they, they, they manage it themselves because they don't want to pay somebody 20%. And then have to pay the 15% self-employment tax too. So it sounds like the play here is to do two things. One, make sure that your average stay is seven days or less. And then the second thing is to make sure that you are actively involved. You're not hiring yes, a management exactly. company, not right. providing quote unquote substantial services. Yeah. So it's, you want to have a seven day or less stay and you have to be the, you have to be the person running the day to day operations. There's actually seven different tests that I don't want to walk through all of them in today's episode. But as long as you're the one that's performing, I would say 90% of the work on that property. So obviously you're the one that's underwriting it, or you're doing the due diligence, you're staging it, you're doing all the guest communications yourself. Sure, you can have a cleaner and still qualify. Um, you just have to meet hours. It's based on your hours, how many hours you actually spend in the property, that particular property, in order to qualify. Most of our clients... As long as you can spend at least 100 hours in a short-term rental, and if you want a list of what activities count, I got it on my website, learnlikeacpa.com. There's a tab that says shop. You click on the cart and you put in a material participation tracker. It'll tell you what hours count, which ones don't. But as long as you have 100 hours and that your time is more than anybody else's, so your 100 hours is greater than the cleaners, you're gonna be able to use those losses to offset your W-2. So it's a lot to take in, but Worst case, you don't, you don't, maybe you don't qualify. So what? So then your loss goes against other rental income. Right. Or it just gets banked to the future. So if you have a loss that you're not able to take. So when I bought my duplex, like I had a loss because it was a long-term rental and I wasn't a real estate professional, I wasn't able to take the loss. I'm able to carry it forward until future years. And this, sometimes this is actually more beneficial because when you're first starting out in your real estate career, like you're making the least money least amount of money that you'll ever make. And by taking, by having that loss that year and not using it and actually carrying it forward, sometimes it actually comes out better. Cause you know, I might be in a 12% or 22% tax bracket that first year I bought real estate and now I'm in a 35 or a 37, you know, I just got a 20% ROI by electing to just defer it a few years. And is there another loophole where if you earn a certain, less than a certain amount of income, 
you know, maybe 100, 120, mm. 5,000, you can actually take passive losses, you know, assuming that you qualify for some other things. Yeah, so that is, that's for long-term rentals. For long-term rentals. Yeah, so long-term rentals, if you make less than 100 grand, this is single or married. I don't know why they don't change that, but <laughs> I was able to use this my first year too, a little bit. If you make less than 100 grand, you're able to take up to $25,000 in passive activity losses. So like in my example, I bought a quarter million dollar property, lived in one unit, ran out the other. So his unit, his unit was, let's call it 125. Well, you know, if I'm making below that $100,000 mark, I'm able to accelerate the depreciation on his unit. And I talked about this in a different podcast, but I got about $30,000 of depreciation from his unit. So I was able to use my entire $25,000 loss. Uh, $25,000 loss is what they allow you to take if you make less than 100 grand. $25,000 loss at my 24% tax bracket plus Illinois is 5%, that's 29%. That's about six grand in tax savings. That was actually cheaper than my down payment on the property. I bought it wow. FHA. Wow. So yeah. I was I actually got my first FHA property funded by the government. Mm. Because I was able to use FHA loan, get seller credits, but then on the back end accelerate that depreciation, qualify, and just really use the tax code to my advantage. So it was actually kind of crazy. Because of the seller credit, I got a check at closing. It was only like 400 bucks, but I got paid at closing. Even though I bought the property, I got paid <laughs> at closing. It's crazy. Wow. But then I was able to, on my tax return, do some magic, right? And save money in taxes that way. And I was able to essentially buy the first one for free. And I, I want to teach as many people as possible how to do that. Why don't more people do it? Right. I, 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 I'm always curious around this question, right? So the house hacking in general, house hacking, yeah. you know, tax savings, right? People, people hear about real estate, but then they, they never actually get around to owning properties when, even though they know about all the benefits. I think it comes around the idea that you have to be the first person in your family to break the mold, to be that person that steps up and changes your family tree forever. Like I had parents, discipline, hard workers, but they didn't know how to invest. You have to be that first, be that first person in your family tree to change everything completely, to be that investor, to buy that first multifamily house. It, I think it all comes down to mindset. Um, you know, the schools don't teach it. And if our parents don't teach it, then where do we go to learn it? I think with bigger pockets and just social media and content in general, it's done wonders for this generation of investors. I mean, 20, 25 years ago, you know, you, you, there was no buying real estate out of state unless you were a big, you know, commercial firm. Nowadays, people buy property sight unseen or managing it from, you know, I have people from California that are managing properties in Florida or California in the Smokies. You have to, but it all comes down to, you have to be that first person, I think, in your family to break that, not a generational curse, but you have to be that first person that wants that knowledge, that's hungry for that appetite that changes your family tree, right? JB says it all the time. Yeah, I mean, there's there's one person that comes in your lifetime. Mm. It could be you, you know, to change the, tra the trajectory of your entire family. You know, I think Ed Milet talks about it all. Yeah, the time. he does. You know, being that that one person in your life, your lifetime or your generational family lifetime. Yep. So. And uh, you know, the Bible says a, a good man leaves his children's children an inheritance. I think about that a lot. And you know, I. I me personally, I don't have any sort of money goals, I would say, because it's not like they take a, a snapshot of your tombstone when you pass away and they put your bank statement on there, right? Like uh, Maya Angelou said, people will forget the things you did, people will forget the things you said, but they'll never forget the way you made them feel. And I think by having status, having wealth, and being able to give that back to the community and, and my surrounding um, resources, that to me is more powerful than any amount of wealth that I could accumulate. 100%. Powerful. 100%. So from, this will be my last accounting question before we get into more of your, you know, your story and your portfolio. Why, why would someone not do a cost segregation on every property? Um, the first thing that comes to mind is the holding period. So first off, you know, if, if you're fixing and flipping a property, you can't do it because you're just going to you're going to fix it, flip it. You're, it doesn't qualify to be depreciated because you're not able to fix and flip. You're not able to depreciate fix and flips. So that's number one. The number two um, would be holding period. So if you're not, because all, all the accelerating the depreciation is, is you're, you're pretty much getting paid up front by the IRS. 
because part of that piece is you end up having to give it back at one point in the future. And the idea is we're going to accelerate those expenses now. And time value of money says that our dollar today invested is worth more than six, seven years later. Right. So we'll we'll take the tax savings now and we'll pay that back. But we're going to be paying that back with the money that we saved. So what I tell people is use the tax savings to pay the tax. Right. Because if I accelerate depreciation, I get 40, 50 grand this year and I use that 50 grand to go buy another rental. Right? And then I use that savings that I got from that rental. And the next thing you know, after seven years, I got five rentals that I'm able to buy, pay that tax bill with. So that would be the second thing. You know, if the holding period, I would say, is, you know, not at least if you don't foresee yourself holding that property for at least four or five years, you shouldn't want to accelerate it because you're going to end up having to pay it back. The other things that we look to is um, the state. So in certain states, just to call out California, New York, where a lot of the value of the building is associated to the land that the building sits on, not necessarily the building. So in certain areas, San Jose, for example, I've seen sometimes where the land is actually worth 70% of the purchase price. And remember, you can only depreciate the building. And so you wouldn't want to do it on that property because it wouldn't be worth it. And this is something I tell all investors too, is when you, when you're looking at a property, uh, go pull up some recent comps, go pull up some recent sales, because you're going to want to do that anyway to see how high your property tax bill is going to jump because the sale will all, always trigger reassessment. So you're going to, you're going to do that anyway. Why don't go check out three or four properties that fit the same comparables and see what is their breakout between building a land, right? In Florida, sometimes Florida gets that like that too, where it might be 40, 60, 50, 50. So th the land piece. And then I would say the last part of it is, um, income. So wherever your income is, that's the, for that particular year, those are the tax savings that you're going to get. So back to that example, I wouldn't want to accelerate depreciation where I'm in a 12 or 22% tax bracket because the savings aren't going to be as much as if I was in a 35 or a 32% tax bracket and accelerating the depreciation. Um, and I've had, I've had conversations with people about that of waiting to buy till they're in a higher tax bracket. And, but those are, I mean, typically it's four to five things, right? We, land value, income level, the building itself. There's things that within a building, you may not want to get a study done. So it's so, not a smash. All what the about time. purchase price? Cause I've heard that, purchase price too. Yeah. You know, like if, it, mm -hmm. if it's less than $500,000, maybe it's not worth it, you know, doing a cost segregation study. I mm -hmm. don't know how that's a good, I mean, that's a good general rule of thumb. I really think it, at the end of the day, it all comes back to that individual scenario. See that if I'm buying like a less than a $500,000, property, but I'm only in a, say a 12% tax bracket, it's not going to make sense. But you know, you might have a high earner who's in a 37 who buys less than a $500,000 property. Makes sense. They're still saving 25 grand a year, 30 grand yeah. a year. So to save 500,000, that's a good kind of like the 1% rule in long-term rentals. That's like a good, just throw it out there type of thing. But it really does depend on the individual situation. Like me personally, 35% bracket, if I bought anything less than 500, I'm going to accelerate it, depreciation unless it was maybe like 200. What's the average cost of a cost segregation study in your experience? Right now they're about 2000, I would say, but the, it's kind of crazy. Like I, I kind of mold out a scenario where it's okay. You're going to save 35,000 in taxes this year, but here's what it costs, right? It's going to cost you $2,000 to hire an engineering firm. It's going to cost you X to hire me at the end of the day, you're still saving 30,000. So do you, do you trade that 2000 plus my fee or whatever other fees you have to do in exchange for this? Sometimes it's like a no brainer. Yeah. It, yeah. It, a lot of it, it's really person. And that's why I really want to create courses and boot camps to teach everybody so that they can make an informed decision because you, you two could be, you know, same, same way in your investing careers, similar, but if you're at different income levels or different, even your future, like what do you, what do you think you're gonna do next year or the year after? All these questions you have to ask before you give a yes or no answer. Curious, so like how would a cost segregation study work if Aiden and I own a property together? So typically it's, um, it's split between your guys' ownership. So if you guys were 50-50, and let's say it yields $100,000 of depreciation, you would split those benefits 50-50. Now there's actually what's called, um, it's called a section 704 special uh, arrangement. And you're able to um, arrange how much depreciation each person gets. 
So instead of you getting 50 and he gets 50, he might get 80, you might get 20, or he might get 100 and you might get zero. That's our choice. You can do that. It ha- Typically, you want to see that drafted up in the operating agreement. And the reason you would do this is because you want to shift all that depreciation to somebody who has a higher income bracket because he's going to get more benefit out of it than the other person. Or we see this a lot sometimes with uh, maybe a husband and wife who are are investing heavily and then they get a a mom or an in-law involved. Well, if they're retired, odds are they're in a super low tax bracket, so they don't need that depreciation. So shift it all to the the high earner's uh, partner, which is typically going to be that that, um, husband and wife investor. Shift it all to them because they're going to get more benefit out of it. So you typically, if, if nothing's if nothing's stated, it's based on ownership. But again, if you ha, if you work with a lawyer, you can actually get that drafted up to you know, give you more, give you less. It's a, it's pretty gets pretty creative. Uh, we see a lot too with G, uh, GP and like syndication deals. Sometimes the LPs will be allocated the depreciation until their capital account zeroes out because then they can't take any more depreciation. And then the rest of it gets allocated towards the GPs who are actively managing the deal. So I haven't done those myself yet, but it gets really creative how you kind of allocate depreciation. And again, you can do it. It's perfectly legal. It's pretty cool. And then I think another thing that um, I think the general public is always interested in write-offs, right? Mm -hmm. You know, for, for somebody like myself, like you, you're an accountant, you're a CPA, you guys can talk about this all day long, but like, keep it very simple for the rest of the audience, right? So like, we have this Airbnb, we're here for a real estate conference, arguably, it's a business expense, right? So mm-hmm. what can we write off? Can we write off a portion of this Airbnb or all of this Airbnb? Can we write off our ticket to the conference? Can we write off our, our plane ticket? Um, you know, gas, parking, right? What, what can we write off legally? And how do we go about doing that? Yeah. I, so anything that's ordinary and necessary to run your business and what that means for each business varies, right? Cause I'm a real estate investor, but what if I'm a, um, triple X worker, right? That ordinary necessary to my business is something totally different, right? So where do you draw the line? And that's it. There's, I mean, there's hundreds, thousands of people that have been in tax court for that specific reason. They think that an expense for their business is, you know, ordinary necessary. And the way I explain it sometimes is, you know, if I'm a doctor, let's say I'm a dentist and I have to drive to my work, is it ordinary for me to need to get a car to go there? Of course. Absolutely. Is it necessary that I get like $150,000 Aston Martin? Not at all. Probably we're not, right? So there's there's like ebbs and flows and give and take, but something like this where we're here in Nashville for three days. Well, you're here for a whole week, aren't you guys? Right. Yeah. Um, we're here for a whole week. And something like this is a business expense. Uh, this is going to be, you know, fully deductible, this type of expense. And what I tell people is don't let the tax tail wag the dog because it's not free. So you're still coming out of pocket for this expense. All a deduction or a write-off is, is the government giving you a coupon. And that coupon is equal to whatever your tax rate is. So back to my example, I pay 35% federal and 4.95% in state tax. So I'm in 40% tax bracket. The government gives me a 40% coupon and it says, hey Ryan, take this coupon and go invest it in your business or your real estate. And we're gonna give you 40 cents on the dollar of whatever you buy. So my thousand dollar repair or the two thousand dollars that I paid to get those trees cut the uh, last week, I really only had to come out of pocket for sixty percent of that because the government's giving me a write off for the other forty. So that's how write offs work in a nutshell. Is it's not it's not a freebie. Nothing in life is free except the air that you breathe. That's what my dad always <laughs> says. And then even in California, they'd tax you on the air if they could. Yeah, they could. Now, now going back to you know writing this off, let's say it is appropriate. Is there an appropriate way that we document this? and pass it along to our CPA? Yeah, you would, so you're, you're, you're supposed to keep all your receipts, every single one, that's what the code says. You know, if you have bank statements with credit cards that show, it's, that's a third party source that's gonna show your expense. I think that's good. At the, end of the, at the end of the year, we don't wanna see bank statements, we wanna see profit and loss statements, revenue minus expenses. So I would say, as far as keeping receipts go, you really wanna keep anything that's material to your business. So call it maybe 5% of your total expenses for the year or 10% of your total expenses. You know, if I, if I have like, I'm not saving every single $20 meal, but again, if I have, you know, if I have $20,000 of rent coming in and I, and I pay two grand to get trees cut down, I'm going to want to save that receipt because it's material to my 
my revenue. Now, so my wife is an agent, right? Um, she qualifies for real estate professional status. Would I, since I'm married, do I get that assumption as well or does that's, that pass on to me? Yeah, that's actually the awesome part is because for, for real estate professionals in general, we actually have a few uh, husband and wife that are able to do this where one person's going out W2 making a killing and then the other person maybe stays, stays at home and does all the rental property stuff. You only need one spouse and, and, a, and a partner and a husband and wife to qualify as a real estate professional for the other person to also get those benefits. So in, in particular, we have one client who, um, not to say any names, CEO, major company, major investment bank, you know, maybe three and a half million, four million dollar salary. But the wife stays, stays home and manages the 80 unit portfolio. Wow. Able to offset a majority, not all of it, never all of it, but able to offset a majority of that $3 million salary because one of them is a real estate professional. It's really, really cool. And it's a, it's a common strategy for high earners. Or I was, I was messaging somebody on Instagram this morning. He goes, he goes, Hey, my son's a, my son's a professional athlete. He's so-and-so he plays on, he plays on an NFL team. And if I said his name, like you would know who he was. <laughs> he goes, I want him to qualify as a real estate professional. And I'm like, well, you know, you had to spend a ton of time in real estate. It, it'll be really hard to prove that so-and-so QB on this team qualifies, right? Because <laughs> like, how is he, where's he going to find the time of day to manage real estate? I'm like, but his spouse, is, is he married? Oh yeah, he's married. Okay, let's get to work on that. Spouse. There's your out. And now this, you know, wow. <laughs> NFL player can offset their uh, NFL earnings through real estate by investing in real estate. Because here's another thing too. Um, 70% of the people who win the lottery go broke. And you'll hear all these stories about NFL, NBA players that also go broke too. Because it's one thing to make the money, but you also have to learn how to save and invest it and, and make more money. Mike Tyson won, Mike Tyson made $300 million in his career. He's only worth five now. Can you imagine that? Wow. Something like that. He didn't learn like a CPA. No, he it was not learning like a CPA. But I mean, back to that example, that, that's a... That's something I'm thinking about maybe shifting gears towards is like finding these high earner uh, professional athletes, getting their spouse on board and just mad. I mean, we're talking half a million dollars in tax savings per year. Yeah. I mean, I, I think for me, like arguably, you know, as an investor myself and then, you know, seeing other investors in the same circle and they don't have a solid CPA and a good bookkeeper, that's a high ROI on the return of mm -hmm. protecting all that and, you know, tackling the tax savings that you could you could be warning so everybody out there man get with ryan at least have a call have a call yeah this dude is really saving tons of money and like you said like i, I love the idea of like a high earner being able to allocate what their tax savings would be to buy another rental mm -hmm. think about that in five or ten years you're creating that generational wealth that we're talking about yep yeah back to square one right and yeah. And then, and then to take it a step further, to teach those after you to do it, your friends and your family, your kids. And, and t so now your tree is expanding. So now you got two or three kids that are also doing it, or you got friends and family that are doing it. I've, I've been trying to put my friends on FHA forever, you know, but it doesn't Same. seem to click. All three of us are all on FHA. Us, yeah. <laughs> all of us are house hacking, all of us are FHA. It's <laughs> so funny. It's so like funny. Squad. Literally all three of us. That's funny. So, Say someone, someone, someone comes up to you and say, Hey Ryan, you know, I've come across your page. I love what you're doing. You know, I'm getting started into real estate investing. Like how, how can I be a good client for you? What are some things that you're looking for to qualify whether or not you would mm -hmm. work with someone? Yeah. So right now I, I pretty much do the outreach, just ask a few questions over DM. Uh, I do have a, like a client intake form that gives me a little bit more background of what you own and you know, W2 income and that. But it really starts off with like this one, I have a one hour introductory call that's paid and we break down everything. So like, I want to know everything about you. Like, where do you get your income from primarily? What real estate are you invested in? What do you have in retirement accounts? How many kids do you have? What, what is your experience in real estate? Where do you want to go? And then from that intro call, I'm able to actually in my head run napkin math. And sometimes I'll show it to the, to the potential client of, hey, here's how much I think I can save you this year and the next year. Because sometimes it's not always about saving money now, but how can we how can we defer taxes forever or mm -hmm. indefinitely? And we won't. Well, I won't take on a client unless I think I could save them six times, five times the cost of their annual investment. So I are, I'm already while I'm on that call, 
you know, after the 30, 40 minute mark, I'm already kind of running that in my head of like, hey, if I can't save this person five times what they, they pay me, they're not going to be a client. And I won't, and I'll just tell them straight up like, hey, you know, I appreciate the time, but you know, we're not a good fit. Feel free to reach out if you have a question. But if I can't provide value to that, to, to the community, I won't take them as a client because it's not fair to me. It's not fair to them. That's just good business, man. You have a bright future if you keep that mentality. That's, yeah, that's, that's been the way we've been rolling because you could get all the business, you know, you could get, you could just open your door and get all the business in the world. But if you're not uh, creating that true value in those relationships and that trust, it's not going to go as far as what trust goes because, you know, I speak at one conference or I'm invited to this event and then I meet this guy and this guy, and then I meet this person the next time. And that, that trust and that confidence and like what we were talking about earlier with the social media, it goes so much, it goes more indefinite than just trying to chase the next paycheck. It means so much more, the value and the branding. And I think what I love most about, you know, your brand and, and you as a person is that you're investing while also doing the taxes, right? So you're actually in the game. Yeah. Because there's a lot of tax accountants, you, you would say, and probably agree that don't actually invest, in, especially in short-term rentals. So how important is that, right? To, to understand the rules and regulations and the tax code, but then also be investing yourself. Yeah, people appreciate that. I'm, I mean, sometimes I'm even, I think on some of my strategy calls, I'm not even a tax expert, but I'm more like a philosophy coach or like <laughs> just a mentor. Cause you know, I'll tell people, hey, you know, why don't you go pull that equity out of your primary if you're looking for a down payment, right? And why don't you go pull that equity out here or things that a real estate investor would do, right? Kind of like build the airplane while you're flying it at the same time. Things that a real estate investor would do, but you get that in the form of a CPA. That's like that second set of eyes to kind of tell you, oh, you can move money from here to here or you can, why don't you go get this loan? Why don't you do that? Oh, hey, I didn't know you could buy a, a freaking $500,000 property with 10% down. I never knew that. You know, some people don't know that. Now you know. Or you don't, they don't know that they can do, uh, you know, I was talking to one guy the other day, um, VA loan, 0% down. You can occupy a four unit. You can live for free, make cash flow. Take that money, go buy another one. Just things like that. But it's nice because I, another thing too is I get to learn about all the markets. So I have clients invested in every <laughs> single state and I may or may not have put together a scat plot. <laughs> you <laughs> have the best data in the world. You have literally, you have legitimate. The tax returns. It's, it is, it's face value, man. You got a basic gross income. Yeah. And wow. I may or may not, you know, put something together. Like that. Software as a service. <laughs> I'd pay for that. No, I man. can't do that. <laughs> so just, just, just to wrap up before we get into our formal segment, I did want to kind of walk through your portfolio because, you know, we, we, we mentioned how you're investing. So, you know, how many units do you own and, and where are you primarily invested in? Yeah. So right now I'm just invested in the Chicagoland area. So we do just multifamily in Chicago. I'm like torn between, do I want to expand my multifamily portfolio there because I can service it locally and for the near future, not have to hire out as much as property management, or do I want to start um, buying short-term rentals across the, the country? Right now, for me, it's the financing part of, that we were talking about earlier that's kind of hindering me. But on top of that, like I'm, I'm a passive investor in a lot of like syndications or businesses. So anything that cash flows, like I want to invest my money into it. And so it's like just small time owner, like a laundromat, hair salon, those are the type of activities that I'm in or looking to be in, car washes or two. Um, put in property offers. So, you know, actively investing and just finding out what works. But at, at one point, I wonder if doing a little bit of everything kind of takes away from if I was to just focus on one thing. So I had a met some, somebody I met for dinner the other night told me that, hey, you might be focused on too many things at once. Maybe you got to focus down on one thing. And I think that one thing for me going forward has got to be short term rental. Yeah. I mean, we've realized that in our business, yeah. like my wife and I, you know, as soon as our business started to, to have success, mm -hmm. it was when we focused on just short term rentals. So we got tunnel vision. We said no to every other opportunity. I mean, with real estate, there's so there's a plethora of opportunities to make money, right? Syndication yeah. sound attractive. You see somebody <laughs> flipping properties and making six figures. This guy has a wholesale operation making $3 million a year. Everything looks attractive and they all have their own space in real estate. But, you know, we have to focus on one thing at a time, get really good at that, hone in on that. And it doesn't mean down the line that we can't pivot out of that, right? Or, right. or start to get invested in other things. So I think, yeah, focusing on one thing, that's where it's at. Yeah, what you focus 100%. on, what you win at, for sure. And the, the thing about the syndications too is, you know, a lot of times, 
you know, once somebody runs a short-term rental, they don't want to buy another one the next year. So syndication is a great option. Hey, take that passive income that you got from that short-term rental, um, which you're going to get hit with the tax bill the following year, right? Because if you're taking all your depreciation the first year, there's going to be none left on the table the second year. Go take that money and, and invest in a syndication. So now instead of having to pay Uncle Sam a tax bill, you're invested in a syndication and that money is working for you. Even if you don't want to deal with guests or having to set everything up, you know, get into syndication. There's so many things you could do in real estate. And, and that's why I was back to the beginning. It, it just blesses everybody. There's so many people that are involved and everybody gets their hands on it. And once you get that itch or once you learn, it's like you never go back. I, don't, I feel like. I agree. I always say it's like tattoos. You get one tattoo and then you're just like, uh, I haven't got my first. I, don't get I'm your, like, don't get your first one. It's over. You got that. tattoos? No, <laughs> I want to get one, but I don't want to get 30. That's you get one happen. rental and then you want by a the bunch end, of rentals. By the end of Nashville, we're going to have tattoos. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's going to be, it's going to be, be sick. Trip. Let's, let's document it. Document it. That's good content. I'm down man. to get a tat. It's good content. Always. What, what is it? What, what is the tat going to be? I don't know, but I'm down. So what would be your advice for someone just getting started in the real estate game? Don't wait to invest, invest and wait. Because I think the longer it takes you to get the first deal, you're, you're losing out on all the experience that comes along with it, the, the relationships and just how, the networking and how to do stuff. So even me, for one example, I didn't know about the whole, the timing between when you, when you put that offer in and sign the contract and when you get your inspection and your appraisal. See, so for me, on my first property, I had the inspector come in there before the appraisal or a, a long time before the appraisal, right? And inspector comes in there and you don't like what you see. Well, you know, when the appraisal comes through, uh, I'm trying to figure out how the timing worked on it, but I basically lost my 500 bucks on the appraisal because I didn't go through on the property, right? So like things like that where, okay, now I know, hey, I need to, I need to do this first, then this the next time. And then... That $500 that I would have lost, luckily I work with the same lender, so I got it back. But then I'm able to go tell two or three of my friends that are doing it, hey, make sure you time this up right because you might be out 500 bucks. Because if you, you know, in that particular example, that was the first thing that I learned, just experiences like that. The longer you wait, the more you miss out on those type of things that you're only going to know if you either do it yourself or you learn from somebody else's mistake. 100%. And then what do you think separates those who actually take the action versus those who, who never actually buy a property? I think it's the willpower, the tenacity to want to, to actually go through with something because it's, it's all smoke and mirrors when you're trying to run a calculator or run a deal or run analysis. But until you actually sign the contract and you move forward, that's, that's where like that big first step of the learning experience comes. I think once you, actually get in there. And what separates those who do and those who don't is pretty much that, right? So who was it? Henry Ford said, if you think you can, or you think you can't, you're right. And I think that's what everybody needs to have the mentality of you, your body. And actually this is interesting because when you study like well, weightlifting and muscles in the human anatomy, there's muscles in our body that if we didn't have our brain, we would, they would just snap because they're so powerful in our body. But our brain is telling the muscle to uh, don't snap on me right now. And it, I think it's the same thing. It's like you can achieve so much more than what you think you can. It's just you have to put in that extra step, that effort, or go see somebody else that's your age. And I just met a guy who's a Marine that's 20 years old that's already got three or four properties. So like, damn, you know, if he could do it, anybody can do it, right? So last question, um, you know, our podcast is called Blue Gems and basically it just signifies like knowledge, drops, gems, you know, something really cool and valuable that you can share with the audience. If you could share one last blue gem, it could be about relationships. It could be about real estate. It could be about finance, tax savings, or just life in general. What would you want to share? Um, I don't think anybody has it figured out. I think we're all in this process together and we're just learning from each other. And don't be afraid to reach out and ask questions to people who have been there before. Uh, because the only way to learn from something is to either make the mistake yourself or learn from somebody else who's already made that mistake. And that second option is a lot cheaper than the first, you know, believe, I'm sure you guys will understand that, but don't be afraid to reach out. And, you know, they say like, I hate, I kind of hate this saying, but they say your net worth is your network. Right. But if you're not actually putting yourself in those situations, kind of like to go back to the beginning, you know, if, if you don't come from a family of real estate investors 
how are you going to become a real estate investor? You have to put yourself in that circle of people who are doing it. Cause if you're not, then you're just kind of staying idle. And we never, we never stay, we never stay the same. We're either getting better slowly and slowly every single day, or we're getting worse. Nothing ever stays the same. And if we're not putting ourselves in that right circle or that, that right mindset, we're going to get worse, right? Or not where we want to be in life with, with investing, with our relationships. And it's not all about money, but I think, we should set goals in multiple areas of our life. And typically I'll set goals in let's say five to six areas of my life. And the reason is, is you don't want to focus on one thing because what happens is it's almost like a deck table that has a broken leg, that table's going to teeter or fall over that one way, but you want to be equally uh, committed to different areas of your life, whether it's, you know, family goals, spiritual goals, relationship, money goals, career goals, if you're not putting equal attention to all of them, something's going to suffer. At one point, something's going to suffer. If you're away for work too much, you know, your family life's going to suffer. If you're at your, if you're hanging out with your family all the time, like you're not going to maybe do so well in your career. Right. So it, it goes both ways, but you have to put equal effort, I think across, not just investing, not just money, but across your entire life. And I love it. Thank you, brother. Really appreciate it. Thanks so much, brother. Amazing. Yeah.